Welcome to the Sales Podcast, Session 81. It's time to grow a pair. Welcome to the 81st edition of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have six-time New York Times best-selling author Larry Wingett, an uh, author of books uh, by the name of such as, oh, I don't know, You're Broke Because You Want to Be, How to Stop Getting By and Start Getting Ahead, and his latest one, Grow a Pair, How to Stop Being a Victim and Take Back Your Life, Your Business, and Your Sanity. Um, as usual, if you are familiar with Larry, he holds nothing back. If you are not familiar with Larry, you will want to listen to this. It is PG-13, so you're fine. It's even probably PG. I mean, we don't get crazy here, but Larry and I hold nothing back, okay? This is real world, uh, get down to brass tacks, sales training and salesmanship uh, and business, entrepreneurial growth, uh, advice, training, recommendations, and good old-fashioned butt-kicking. Because you know what? You only hurt the ones you love, right? I mean, we're going to call it like we see it because it's what you need to hear. Uh, so along those lines, today's little funny, if you will, is more of a, of a truth kind of statement. It comes from Mad Magazine. It was written quite a while back. And it says, the only reason a great many American families don't own an elephant is that they have never been offered an elephant for a dollar down and easy weekly payments. Think about that. I thought that was a great uh, semi-funny but more uh, thought-provoking statement uh, to kick things off. So let's slide right into the sales podcast creed, which is today is my day. I work diligently towards my goals, which are bigger than me. I bite off more than I can chew because only then will I truly know my current limits and surpassing them becomes my new goal for today. Through education, accountability partners, and bold, decisive action, Today will be better than yesterday, and tomorrow will be better yet. I'm ready to produce. If you are ready to produce more sales, do two things. Number one, pause this and go to theartoftheclose.guru. That is kicking off again on September 2nd. Now, you'll have immediate access to 30-day sales growth. And uh, this is seven live calls uh, with me, 66-plus page workbook. Uh, it's interactive, and you'll have access to this course forever, meaning you can access the archives, but you can sit in on future classes as well. So check out theartoftheclose.guru and sign up now. It's $100 more than it was the last time I did this, and next time it'll be $100 more again. So invest in yourself and save a little money. So now, without further ado, here's my interview with Mr. Larry Wingett, the pit bull of personal development. Larry Wingett, fellow cigar aficionado, whiskey connoisseur, speaker, author, entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I think you and I, I may have to borrow your uh, what, irritational speaker. Uh, or, you can't do that. It's uh, trademarked. I own it. I know. I'm, I'm asking permission to borrow every now and then because like, uh, I like to be a little... Um, Pound them in the head as well. But, hey, thanks for joining us from uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. It's great to have you on the show. Oh, I'm glad to do it. Thanks for having me. Uh, as we were talking uh, before, you know, the, the only set question I always ask is, you know, even though you've got, what, six New York Times uh, best-selling books, you've been in this business a long time, there's still people, unfortunately, that do not know who you are. So would you mind just take a minute or two, uh, give us a little rundown, and, and we'll dive into the meat of things? No problem. I can't figure out where they might have been living under a rock somewhere and never to have heard of me. Don't they have a television set or ever go in a bookstore? But I am Larry Wingett. I am known as the pit bull of personal development. I have written all those bestsellers, just like you said. I'm a regular on uh, many uh, news shows, national news shows. I've had my own television show on A&E. Uh, so I've been PBS specials, CNBC specials, uh, turn on Fox News every week. You'll see me on there. So I'm pretty much everywhere. I grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma, dirt poor, figured out how to get rich, and uh, worked my butt off to make sure I got that way. Been uh, speaking professionally for about 23 years now. I've spoken to over 400 of the Fortune 500 companies. So I've been around for a while giving my brand of personal development. Well, so for everyone that's about to tune out because you mentioned Fox News, I'd say, look, open your minds for another few minutes. Uh, you oh, my some... goodness. <laughs> I get so sick of that. For anybody to say, well, I'm not going to watch Fox 
Fox News, it'd be like a conservative saying there's never been anything good said on MSNBC. You got to listen to all sides and then make up your own mind. Nobody ought to be listening to any talking head just so they can always believe what that talking head says. It's supposed to make you think. And anything that makes you think, and you'll know if you're thinking, if it's made you mad, if it's triggered an emotion. Well, there you go. So you started out, as you said, grew up in Oklahoma, grew up poor. I grew up in the South as well, Baton Rouge and Houston. Uh, We had a little money, then then we didn't have money. Uh, And I seem to remember the not having money part uh, better. Uh, so what did you do? How did you figure out how to get rich? Because, you know, I work with a lot of salespeople and entrepreneurs, uh, that are very good at what they do. Uh, but they are not rich. They are far from rich. I mean, they're slaves to their jobs. I mean, what, what did you figure out? And what do you tell people how to, how to become their own success story? Listen, uh, growing up in Muskogee, when I was 13, I walked into my eighth grade class and a kid made fun of me. He said, when gets up to own a pair of blue jeans you got? And it was. Because they had a rip in the pocket, and it was obvious not every pair of jeans you've got can have a rip in the same place every single day. (laughs) And he humiliated me in front of a bunch of little 13-year-old girls, and I made up my mind at that moment. I made a decision that I was going to figure out what it took to get rich. Now, I didn't know what it was going to take. I didn't have any role models. I wasn't reading personal development books and all that stuff way back then when I was in the eighth grade. The only thing I knew that I could do better than anybody else is I could outwork them. That's it. I'm amazed at entrepreneurs that say I'm giving it my all, and then they sit and surf and and, and the internet all day long. Or they, you ask a a typical entrepreneur, entrepreneur, what you've been doing all day. They said I've been tweaking my website. Really? Did that make you any money at all? You know, they can come up with a million reasons for why they're not doing what they need to do. What's the number one thing that any entrepreneur has to do in order to make money? Well, you got to sell stuff. What's the number one thing any salesperson has to do as a salesperson? you got to sell stuff. Well, how do you sell stuff? Well, you talk to customers. That's, it's very, very simple. You talk to customers and ask them to buy. So it always comes down to how many people have you asked to buy your product today? How many people have you asked to buy your service? And if you go, well, and everybody starts a story with, well, I'm not looking for a story. I'm looking for a number. Tell me how many people you have talked to. I was a sales manager for a long time. I started in this business as a sales trainer. And my guys used to come in, I'd say, how many did you sell this week when I was in the telephone business? And they'd say, well, Larry, and I'd say, no, 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 shorter stories. And finally, I had a big sign made in my office that said, shorter stories. I'm looking for a number. How many people did you ask to buy? That's what it always comes down to. You know, all these books have been written on how to sell stuff. This is all it takes. Ask. And then people will say, well, no, Larry, I think it takes more than that. No, it doesn't. Just ask. Well, what if they say no, Larry? We'll ask them again. Well, what if they say no? We'll ask them again. Well, what if they say no then? Well, go ask somebody else. Don't be stupid about it. Just keep asking people to buy. Well, I love what you said there. And, and, you know, you said it so quickly. I want to go back for a second because... (laughs) It's, you you mentioned, you said, how much did you sell? But the other part you said was, how many did you ask to buy? Because I've been that in my sales training. You know, we cannot control, unless we have a firearm with us yep. pointing at their head, we cannot control if they do buy. But we can't control how many people we ask, right? Put We can't control if we put ourselves into a selling situation or a buying situation. We can ask somebody to buy. So do you, you think, I mean, it's a nuance, right? But do you think really that that's the key is just, putting yourself in the situation to at least make a No, sale? actually, I think the key is, uh, is don't offer yourself any excuses why you are not in that situation. That's really the problem. Entrepreneurs get so busy doing all those things that do not matter. The only thing that matters, especially if you're hungry and starving and not rich, is selling stuff. So how do you sell stuff? You ask people to buy. That's it. You've got to put yourself in that situation. That's really, everybody understands you got to be in that situation, but they get so caught up in all those other things, believing those things matter. And bottom line is, they don't, don't matter. Tomorrow, will it make any difference whether you tweaked your website or not, whether you did this or whether you did that? No. But tomorrow, it will make a difference if you didn't put yourself in a situation to ask people to buy. Right. 
Uh, but Larry, it's 2014, and I've got a tweet, and I got a Facebook, and I need to blog. Um, are you saying that isn't important? No, nope, not saying that at all. I'm saying just manage your priorities. It can't become a priority for you to do that. Listen, I would imagine. Uh, I mean, you follow me on Facebook. I have probably, especially at my level of operation, I am probably the most active guy at my level on Facebook. I actually talk to people who post on my page. I argue with them. I'll have a conversation with them. And you know how long that takes every single day if you added all that up? Maybe a half hour. Yeah. Just maybe a half hour. The problem is people sit there like this, and they just watch their Facebook page, <laughs> and they're just waiting for somebody to say something. And seeing how many likes they get or shares they get or whatever, that doesn't do you any good. Right. Set your priorities and make sure that you're not giving an inordinate amount of time to things that don't matter. Uh, so do you think people just haven't hit rock bottom in some way and, and, it, and it's fear? Because, like, to a degree, you know, when you were 13, that was kind of your rock bottom, right? That humiliation stung, and you remember it now yep. you know, almost 40 years later. Right and 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 that fifty compared, years later <laughs> was, was that fifty years later. Are you sixty three? I'm sixty one. Oh, all right. Well, hey, I was giving you a little a little uh, props there. There you go. Uh, and it's Monday morning, man. You know my math's a little off. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know I've I've seen that before. It's like when people get burned enough in sales or get lied to or. They get foreclosed, or their home get their car gets repossessed, and finally, you know, they're living on a couch in a basement, and they're you know, buddy, and they're like, "All right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna go do something." You know, it, do you think it takes something like that? You know, unfortunately, to to propel people to do what it takes to get to that next level. You know, for some people, it does take that. Not for everybody. I mean, some people really are uh, susceptible to motivation. And, and you started this thing off by saying I was an irritational speaker. You're right. I'm the world's only irritational speaker. It's trademark. See, I don't believe I can motivate you to go from where you are to a better place. I'll guarantee you I can make you so irritated with where you are that you'll do anything in this world to go to a better place. I'm one of those guys that I always kind of had to hurt before I was willing to make the change. And right now in society, uh, we don't have people hurt enough. Uh, it's, it's too comfortable for them. We allow people to suffer, but they suffer in comfort. You know, if it gets bad enough, there's always a place to go. There's always a bailout program. There's always a situation where somebody will come to your rescue. It, it, and, and that's a shame. A true friend won't rescue you. You talk about living in your buddy's basement. A true friend will say, why don't you just get off your butt and go do something? Mm -hmm. I'll be a real friend to you. You're lazy, you're irresponsible, and you're better than this, and I expect more from you than this. That's a better friend. And so I do think some people have to hit the bottom. It has to really hurt for them to change. Not everybody, but some people do. So you talk about, I can irritate you to get to a better place. You know, a lot of times I'll tell people in sales training that our job as salespeople is hurt and rescue, right? Like a, people, if they knew the ramifications of their situation and of not doing something, if they truly understood how they were at risk, they would take action and they would buy that computer from you or they would buy that new car or whatever. But usually they, they don't know. They're, they're comfortable, right? Or they're afraid to make a change uh, would you say that, would you agree with that, that our job is, is that to irritate, that to hurt and to rescue, to, to really get the prospect foaming at the mouth, to really realize they got to do something or, or they're going to suffer? Well, I, I was a sales trainer for a lot of years. Like I said, I started in this business as a sales trainer. I've written a lot of sales training material, and I believe that all selling is uh, solving a problem. And if you're not able to identify the problem and make that problem real to someone, then they're never going to buy from you. It has to be real to them. In other words, you have to touch some sort of an emotion. You have to make them afraid of what would happen if they don't take action. And so in that respect, I do believe that that fear, that creating that sort of angst in them, and if it's comes down to you got to create it in your own life, well, then that's what will still get you to take action to solve your problem. But identify the problem. And that's sort of, I used to ask people, what are the, what are the uh, consequences for non-performance? 
And people don't think of consequences. If you didn't do this, what's going to happen? You can do the same thing with your customer. Mr. Customer, what happens if you don't do this? Right. And if you can make those consequences real, well, then you've got a real prospect on your hand, man. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you have, you know, the, the pit bull of professional development. And, you know, obviously you're, you're very much in people's face. Grow a pair, how to stop being a victim. You're broke yeah. as you want to be. Shut up, stop whining. <clears throat> I'm a big proponent of big headlines, you know. I mean, put it out there. I think it was Dan Kennedy, you know, says if you don't irritate somebody by noon, you're not marketing. Yeah. Um, what do you say to people who, you know, say, oh, but my business is different. I'm a chiropractor. I'm a dentist, you know. I'm the local computer repair guy. I can't be uh, that confrontational. Uh, it's not about being confrontational. I don't expect people to become little mini versions of Larry Wingate. But what I do say, like in grow a pair, grow a pair is not about what's hanging between your legs. It's what's between your ears. And that's where people have to get strong. And I'm just talking about touching an emotion in people. You know, if I write a book, I have to touch emotions. Uh, one of the greatest books on how to write a book is uh, Stephen King's book on writing. And there, he talks about how there are only four basic emotions. You know, glad, mad, sad, or scared. And you've got to do the same thing when writing a book, telling a story, giving a speech, as you do when making a sale. You've got to emotionally connect with somebody. Now, I can do that by making you laugh and making you happy and becoming uh, engaged with you in that respect. I can also do that in my style. And I am a little confrontational. So I get people to think that way. That's why I, I talk the way I do. That's why I'm rapid fire. Like you said, I say it so fast. But I make people go, whoa, what's that about? But I get their attention and I connect. You have to figure out, regardless of what your personal style is, you must figure out a way to connect, get people engaged, get them to think, touch an emotion. And do you think, I mean, people become too much of an expert or too wrapped up in the intricacies of their work? And they think, oh, well, it's, it's just obvious, you know, this type of chiropractic care is just obvious. And if I just show them the better technique, they will come. But that, that's too logical, right? And they, they kind of got to get out of their own head to, to make You know, one of the biggest connection. disservices that was ever done was the stupid movie Field of Dreams, Build It and They Will Come. Uh, you know, if you take it all the way back to, and which is another way of saying that old, old line, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. That is the dumbest crap ever proposed, ever, ever, ever. You have to take what you do to other, somebody else. You have to take it out there. You can't sit back and wait for the world to bring riches your way. You got to go get it. And, and I think that's one of the mistakes people made. They say, well, I've got the best idea. I've got the best product. And that doesn't really make any difference. I can guarantee you there are amazing salespeople selling crap products because they're better salespeople, and they're selling them for more money. When you look at the marketplace, you can see in so many different ways that the marketplace does not respect the quality of a product as much as it does the, uh, the great marketing, advertisement, salesmanship that goes behind that product. So if you're not doing well, and, and I love something else you said there. Uh, do people get it up in their own mind and do they overthink it? Absolutely. I wish people would think less. Just stop complicating stuff. When you start thinking about stuff, you'll give yourself a million reasons why it won't work. Stop thinking, get off your butt, and go ask somebody to buy something. That's really what it comes down to. You know, it's. Um, I served in the Air Force, traveled the world, and I really learned this being in Korea and in the Middle East, and that was haggling. You know, the art of negotiation, and, and that it's it's not rude, it's not. Uh, it doesn't have to be uncomfortable. It can be a game. It can be fun. It can be part of the process. But you know, we're raised here in America, right? I mean, talking about money is no. Oh, sh- you know, you, you better you probably better off talking about sex or religion than asking somebody how much money they make. You know, people so, lie to you more about money than any other thing. So how how do we how do we help people get out of their own heads about that? You know, because they we grow up thinking money is this dirty topic, and now we're an entrepreneur, and we're in sales, we own a business, and we're afraid to ask for the order. We're afraid to raise our prices, uh, and I mean, it's just a recipe for disaster. Well, you know, it's a it's a shame when people understand the importance of money, yet they're so afraid to talk about money. 
You know, it, I the very first question when people call my office and say we'd like to talk about Larry having them come speak, the very first thing my manager says is how much money do you have? I mean, you got to get that out of the way. It does no good to establish need and want and desire for Larry and check the date to see if I'm available, only to find out 20 minutes into the conversation they didn't have enough money to begin with. You ought to just get that right out of the way. And so I always bring up money first. I believe money is a great place to start the conversation. Uh, and and why, do, why are people so afraid of money? We have been taught that it's dirty. I don't believe that at all about money. I like money. I like the cup. Money goes with every color I wear. I think it's one of the coolest things out there. I enjoy it. And, you know, the people who say it's the love of money and so forth, they tend to forget. There's never been a hospital built, never been a church built, never been a homeless shelter built. We don't feed hungry kids. We don't help third world countries. We don't do anything for anyone on a charitable charitable basis unless there's a whole lot of money involved money is a good thing mm -hmm. uh so so what if somebody is struggling right now but they're motivated right they're maybe they're a professional salesman you know as i was i was in corporate america for many years but reading books trying to get better uh dabbling you know then finally jumping in with both feet into my own business uh or but maybe they're an entrepreneur they, they're on their business they're struggling you know, you said don't you know, quit tweaking your website, do what works. Uh, <clears throat> what what should somebody do today? I mean, they, they listen, to, they finish listening to this podcast. Maybe they're listening to it on the way to work first thing in the morning. Uh, what should they do right now uh, to stack the odds in their favor to make more money by the end of the day, by the end of the week? Ask somebody to buy. Right now, if you're listening to this, when you stop listening, I want you to look at all the customers that are in your sales funnel, people you've made contact with, people who have shown some sort of interest, people who have called you or you've called them, and the relationship has been established. Call every one of those people today and ask them what it's going to take. What is it going to take for you to make this decision? I, I used to like to do it like this, I, and there are lots of ways to close a sale. And getting good at closing sales is just comes down to asking people a variety of questions in a variety of ways. I always like to say, what have I done wrong? Because obviously, you want this. You've decided you need this. There's something I have not done. And if that's the case, I want to apologize to you. I should have done a better job as a salesperson. What have I done wrong? Because if I had done my job right, this deal would have already been done. And ask them. And what's funny is that customers will come to your rescue. They'll say, you haven't done anything wrong. Here's what it would have taken. Oh, then let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> it really is that simple. And uh, I'm glad you said that, that apologize thing. Because I, I do that same thing. You know, I'll send an email. If I can't reach them, I apologize. And they always open that email. They're like, yeah. <laughs> What is this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. If people would just say, I'm sorry, I have not done my job. What should I have done differently? What the about, customer will make the sale for it. What about handling gatekeepers? Because uh, they're going to pick up the phone. They're going to, they dial it 30 times a day trying to reach that decision maker. They'll probably reach a, a gatekeeper of some sort 25 times. Yeah. Uh, what do they say to that person to increase their odds of reaching that decision maker? First of all, you honor their position. People only want to be validated in some way. Every one of us wants to be validated. You validated me when this call started. I mean, because, you, you know, you, you talked a little about me, made me feel good about who I was and all that sort of stuff. You have to validate the gatekeeper. You have to say to them, listen, I know it's your job to keep me away from him because you're right. I've got to sell something. That's my job. So how can I work with you? What information do you need from me for you to put this call through so I can get to that person? What do I need to do differently? Should I schedule it so to send you an email? You help me because you have a job to do, and I honor that. And I have a job to do. And they'll go, well, thank you so much. The problem is salespeople get mad at the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper's just doing their job. That's what they're supposed to do. So work with them, not against them. When you make them an adversary, 
Well, you might as well shut the door and move on to somebody else. Mm-hmm. You, you have made an enemy of the wrong person. Yeah. So, did I understand you right? Like, you just said to tell the truth in sales? <laughs> most direct salesperson in the world that I always was. I really was. I said, listen, this is what I sell. This is how much it costs. It's my job to get you to buy this. I'm here today to figure out what that's going to take. You can help me. And, and these are the questions I need answered. And we'll know real quick whether you're a prospect for me. Yeah. Hey, even, just tell the truth to people. People will embrace the truth. Believe me, I know. Well, I, mean, I love it because I... You know, in the training that I do, I, I give people some lines and things to do. and But I tell them, say, look, I, I'm giving you a little bit of ammunition, really just to give you the confidence to yeah. go out there. You know, because I tell them, once you truly view selling as a profession, as a calling, just like being a teacher or a doctor, and, and you apply yourself and grow, then that, like Zig Ziglar said, right, it's selling is a, conf- is a transference of a feeling, that feeling is confidence. Once you have that confidence... Words and phrases and questions will just pop out of your mouth. And you'll be like this out of body experience, right? Like, where'd that come from? It's like, it comes from your confidence, right? Well, the, the, the problem with most sales trainers is that they teach, and I, I, I've talked about this much from the stage in the past, uh, they teach that when the customer says this, you say that. Right. And so you go out there memorizing all this sort of stuff. So when the customer says this, I'm ready with that. And then the problem is the customer never says this, and you're left with all of that. (laughs) And what I talk about is really, and most of what you've talked about here, is developing a philosophy for selling. You don't have to get the words right. You really don't. When I talk to people about how to give a great speech, get out of your head, stop giving a speech, and talk to people. That's what we're really talking about here, is that I know what I'm doing, I'm confident in myself and my product and the ability that my product has to solve your problem the only thing i have to do right now is figure out if you've even got a problem and if it turns out in a couple of minutes you don't i will thank you for your time and walk away and find somebody else and would it be fair if i spent just a couple of minutes with you i don't want to waste your time i don't want you to waste mine i gotta make a living Mm -hmm. and people will go you know that's fair I know, just drop the cat in the punch bowl. Yeah. You <laughs> uh, are from the South, if you say that. <laughs> uh, so let, let's talk about writing books and speaking. I mean, those are uh, great ways, obviously, to establish yourself as an expert. Uh, do you have tips, suggestions for people that, uh, that are looking to break into either or both of those arenas um, to, to get their own word out? You know, well, I'm doing a big conference in November where people can come. I'm going to spend three days on the platform teaching people how to write books and give speeches and write a keynote that sells and all that sort of thing. Uh, Is that on your your website? uh, It's about to be on my website. We're still establishing the location right now. But it'll be November, I think it's uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th. Three full days with me on stage talking about those things. Okay. But... Here's the, th- here's the thing. It goes back to what we said a minute ago. Know what problem you want to solve. You've got to know that. It, let, me, let me tell you, people don't care about you. People don't care about your content. People don't care about any of that stuff. They care about what you and your content can do for them. So figure out in advance what problem it is you want to solve with the speech you're going to give or the book you want to write. If you can't identify a problem, then don't bother. And then figure out what makes your point of view, your solution, and your point of view based on your experience and your research and so forth makes it unique so it doesn't look like everybody else is out there. You know, I'm probably the best branded guy in the personal development industry. Nobody looks like I do. Nobody says it like I say it. You know, nobody's as confrontational. Nobody does it quite like I do it. And that's what makes me, when you go into a bookstore and look at all the personal development books, you can almost say, which one of these is not like the others? (laughs) And I'm going to be that one. So when you're thinking about what you want to say, you have to ask yourself, what makes me not like the others? Mm -hmm. Start with a problem, look at your solution, and then figure what makes your solution unique. And then just figure out a good way to say it in an entertaining way, whether you're writing it or speaking it. 
Do you do you think most people they 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 try to attack too many problems at once, or they think, oh, this one little narrow problem isn't big enough to write a whole book or create a whole speech about? So I need to add thirty seven more problems to. Build yeah, this? yeah, I do think you're exactly right. I think people uh, they get their scope way too big, mm-hmm. um, and, and then they don't end up solving anything. They think there's not a big enough market if they take too narrow a niche. Uh, they'll say, well, maybe this only applies to 10% of the businesses out there. Well, how many businesses are out there? So, <laughs> are there a million businesses out there? Let's just say there's a million, and there's more than a million businesses in right. America today. I think there's 23 that, million how, small how businesses. Many? I think there's 23 million small businesses. 23 million small businesses, and you're saying I'm writing something that will only reach 10% of the market. So you could reach 2.3 million businesses. So let's say you're only going to reach 1% of those. You're still going to sell 23,000 bucks? That's pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would, would you recommend somebody getting started? Um, not necessarily getting started, but trying to take things to the next level. Go ahead and self-publish and just and get it out there. Uh, or, you know, how, how, do they, how do they break into that, that space? Build a following first. Won't do you any good to uh, write a book unless there's somebody there to buy it. Right. Build a following first. Uh, I self-published 23 books before I ever sold one to a publisher. Wow. 23 books. And, and that was to build a following so people would know who I was and start to look at me as a resource. When people count on you as a resource, resource, and then you present them with a book or a seminar or a speech or something, you'll have an audience of life. It's, a, it's amazing to me. Here are the stats about books and about self-publishing and about really all books. Um, the average book in America sells less than 300 copies. Mm-hmm. 97% of all books published today Hey, whether they're self-published or published by a publisher, 97% of all books published sell less than 1,000 copies. So the reality is if you're going to beat those odds, you must build a following that relies on you, that counts on you, that looks forward to what you have to say, and then produce something and sell it. <laughs> Very nice. Um, well, what is the best way for people to stay in touch with you? Where, where should we send people? I know you, you got LarryWinget.com. You're, you're active uh, online. Uh, where, where yeah, you know, LarryWinget.com is uh, probably the easiest place to find me and to you know, look at videos that I shoot. I do a, a YouTube series called Ask Larry Anything. People can write me a question, and I'll answer it. I don't care what it's about. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you my favorite cigar, my favorite whiskey. I'll talk about your stupid kid or your <laughs> jerk brother-in-law. It doesn't matter to me. We'll talk about it. Uh, so people can write me at, uh, you know, if you're drinking PBR, bud, we need to talk. <laughs> That's a great tin, man. Look at that. I know it is. And I spent a lot of years drinking PBR growing up in Muskogee, Oklahoma, too. So I like your son. But, uh, you know, you can go to my website and you can find all those links. You can follow me on Facebook at Larry Wingate Fan Page. I got 25,000 people there. I got another 25,000 over on Twitter. That, that follow me at Larry Wingate, and uh, there's LinkedIn. There's all those places. I'm easy to find. <laughs> well, what do you say to people about mixing their personal with their business, like on social media? I mean, who should keep it separate? Who should blend it? You know, is there is there a cut and dried line there, or kind of up to the individual? You know, uh, I have a business page, Larry Wingate fan page, and I have a personal page. Uh, if my personal page was truly just for my friends, I would have five people. Yep. Uh, instead, I got 5,000 people with a waiting list. And uh, so I have to kind of blend the two. Uh, but the, the thing is, if you're really going to do business on social media, you need to establish a big business page where you do business. Mm-hmm. Now, my fan page, I still throw a lot of personal things in there just to remind people that I really am a real human being. <laughs> you know, so you'll see 
Uh, when you got this persona and you're this big of a jerk all the time, people want to know that there is something more there. Uh, you know, I'm too in your face. If I didn't remind them every once in a while that on Friday nights I sit back with a cigar and a, and a, and a drink and relax, that I got dogs that I love, that I got a grandkids that, you know, that I enjoy spending time with. So I do that just to keep myself human. Right. But people do need a business page if they are in business that really – Again, builds that following so people count on you for your point of view and your solution to their problem. Right. Fantastic. Would you have some uh, some parting words of wisdom for our listeners? Well, parting words of wisdom? I've been given wisdom here I, for half an hour. I don't know. I mean, hey, the parting words of wisdom could be go back and listen to this 87 times uh, each time, pick up the damn phone and call somebody in between. <laughs> you know, people are looking for something hard. Uh, the biggest criticism I get online, if you look at all my reviews on Amazon and so forth, uh, all those one-star reviews about my books that balance out all those five-star reviews always say, well, it's just common sense. You know, uh, I've always said there's a big duh factor to everything I do. You know, if I'm in sales, well, why don't you pick up the phone and ask somebody to buy something? And they go, well, well, yeah. Well, yeah. (laughs) Do it. You know, I'm broke. Well, why don't you spend less money than you make? (laughs) None of this stuff. I'm fat. Why don't you eat less and exercise more? People are looking for the tough solutions. And so my parting words is stop complicating it. Sales is really pretty simple. Even if you're lousy at it and your product sucks and is the most expensive thing on the market, if you ask enough people to buy, you can make a living. Somebody will buy it. (laughs) (laughs) Ta-da! All right. Thank you, sir. I will be, uh, actually, I'm driving through Scottsdale on uh, Thursday on my way to Texas. Is that right? Well, you uh, you have a good time. You didn't ask me anything about cigars or whiskey. What do you know? Well, hey, you know what? Let's keep going. I, we, I can bust out of this humidor back here, and we can I'm talking about that new AR-10 I just hey, got. I'll, I'll leave you a parting word. Here it is. It's the best thing I've discovered recently to drink. It's the smoothest thing I have found maybe all year, and I've discovered some good stuff. It's Sam Houston straight American whiskey. All right. It's not a bourbon. It's an American whiskey. It's made in Texas, and it tastes like butterscotch and caramel and all things wonderful. You can drink it like iced tea. It is so smooth, no bite. That's my very new favorite brown liquor. All right. And what's your favorite cigar? You know, I got a bunch of them these days. I, I uh, bought a box of CAO Brasilias this week. Yeah. And I like a good, oily, dark Maduro. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a. I, I like, you know, it's what I tell people about wine or about whiskey. You know, you can buy a Pappy Van Winkle if you can find it and go, well, darn, that's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, the key is not, and it's like buying a $200 bottle of wine and say, well, that's good. Well, it ought to be. It better the key be. is, can you find a great $15 bottle of wine? Right, Anybody right. buy a $30 a stick of uh, uh, a cigar <laughs> and, and say, well, that's a good smoke. If you can find a great $3 stick, then that's something. And that CAO, uh, CAO Brasilia, that's a nice smoke for, at a reasonable price. Mm-hmm. What is it, like a, like a 50? What's the, what's the gauge on it? Oh, you can get lots of different gauges. I, I have a tendency to like torpedoes. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, this, uh, the one I'm smoking right now is about a 6 by uh, 45, probably. Mm-hmm. So, okay. good smoke. Yeah, I like a big Churchill. I don't do it often enough, so when I do, the kids know. Daddy's going to be here a while. <laughs> you know, the best thing about a cigar is it takes an hour to smoke it. Yep. And you can't really do anything else. Yep. That is one of my forced relaxations. Yep. Yep. If I go to the to the patio out there and I put my feet up and I get my Kindle with a good book on it, and I'll get me a two fingers of my favorite uh, brown liquor in there, and I light a cigar, I know for the next hour that's what I'm doing. Right. right. And that's the best part about it. Yeah, we uh, it's too easy to work too hard nowadays. Uh, especially working too hard doing the wrong thing. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that sort of circles around to what we started with. People are busy, uh, but they're not particularly productive. Right, right. And it's because they're focused on the wrong stuff. 
Hey, bud, this has been fun. Thank you. Right. Everybody that comes with and cigars, I feel fulfilled. All right, and uh, I come to Phoenix a good bit, so uh, I'll look you yeah. up when I'm there, and we'll uh, we'll have a cigar. All right, bud. Thanks. Thank you, sir. What do you think about that, huh? You know, apologies for the sound. It was a little bit tinny. Uh, my microphone wasn't working right. Uh, Larry, he was outside as usual. I could see him. We could see each other. Uh, but the, the quality of the information is there. So go back and, and listen to that. You know, it, it was interesting the way that he ended, right? People are busy, but, you know, are they productive? Are you doing the right things? Are you just filling your time with busy work? Uh, you know, get out there. Uh, and do the right things. You know, ask them, what will it take to earn your business? Apologize. What have I done wrong? You know, if you've got something great, you know, you tell them you want and need what I have to offer. What am I doing wrong? How are you not seeing the value? Help me help you. Uh, it sounds kind of funny, right? Old Jerry Maguire, help me help you. But it's true. Uh, if you are struggling, uh, but you have a great offering, then something's uh, going wrong right there. Figure it out. So you can help them, uh, which will help you, which helps the economy, which helps everybody. Uh, all right. So go check out that Stephen King book on writing. Uh, there's a ton of resources at the salesmanspro.com slash 81. I've got links to, um, to that, that book. I've got links to uh, other books of Larry's. You can follow him on Twitter and everything. So all, all the resources and uh, uh, the show notes are there. Um, but like I said, all of these, go back and listen to them more than once. It's, you're not going to learn anything one time through. Uh, you know, if you listen to this in your car or at the gym, go back and listen to it again when you can take some notes, let things kind of sink in, you know, but if something resonates, stop right there uh, and put it into practice. You know, I love what he says when, uh, you know, well is not the answer when I ask you, how many did you sell? Okay. And how many you sold uh, are a direct correlation of how many people did you ask to buy? Okay, and tweaking your website won't make you any money. Uh, and Larry and I have a lot in common, especially the outworking. You know, I've failed at a lot of things. I've made a bunch of dumb decisions. I've made uh, poor investments, uh, thinking others had the answer that I didn't. Uh, it took me a while to learn. It, it made me work hard. But you know what? I had the money to invest in the first place because I worked hard. And because I worked hard, I recovered from those failures. And because I worked hard, uh, I'm accelerating my success. Uh, from this point forward. So you can do the same thing. Okay. Just out hustle everybody and things will fall into place. Uh, if you want a little hand, a little helping hand with that, you want a little encouragement, you want some words of wisdom, you want some, some shortcuts. There's really no shortcut, but I can help you uh, accelerate your learning by not making the same mistakes I made. Okay. And that is a shortcut. Uh, join me September 2nd, for seven calls in The Art of the Close, as I mentioned at the beginning, visit theartoftheclose.guru. Uh, sign up now. Uh, you'll get access to 30-day sales growth. That in and of itself is a $197 course. Um, you'll get immediate access to that. And once you're in, you're in. You'll be able to take this class over and over again uh, to help you continue on your path to sales excellence. Uh, so the art of the guru. like I said before, it's $100 more this time around than it was last time, and it'll be $100 more again. So start now. Thanks, as always, for listening. Please leave some comments on the podcast. Give us a five-star review on iTunes. Share this with family, friends, coworkers, people you love, trust, respect. And I will see you next week. As always, remember to sell different. Mm-hmm.